All right, so I've known Peter for many years, and I know him pretty well, and I just don't think that this is gonna make him happy. You know, even though that's an old Boxster, it could be any one of his prized vehicles. <laughs> and we've got two of these uh, satanic goats on it. Not one, but two of them. Uh, so maybe now, maybe now it'll happen. Maybe we'll get that company goat roast I've been dreaming about with mint jelly and applesauce and roast potatoes. Uh, this could be, uh, this could finally be it. Anyway, hopefully they decide to stay with that Porsche, not come over here and start troubling me. Oh God, one's getting down, it looks like. And there's the other one lurking off to the side. Yeah, all right, well, we'll keep an eye on them, but for the moment, there they are over there. Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on, you know, it's a good enough Florida Wednesday morning, I have to say. Uh, the temperature is in the mid 60s. It's fine. It's nice. It will be hot later, but yeah, we know it's coming. The heat is on the way. It gets here around 11 o'clock, hangs out till 5, and uh, frankly, it's only going to get worse as the months progress. Uh, it's uh, it's only in October or November now where we're going to get a reprieve and get back to some decent weather, hopefully, uh, unless we're robbed of another winter. So. I've consigned myself to it. It is what it is, and I'm going to live with it, uh, even if I plan to con you know, complain about it incessantly. Uh, that is going to be my goal, and of course that does help me get through it. Much as this uh, whiskey has helped me get through this coronavirus thing, uh, which of course is still going on, you still read about it, hear about it. Uh, things have been pretty good in Florida. In the long run, I guess I'm happy to be here uh, of all places because Florida does seem to have had a handle on it uh, pretty good. You know, we've uh, remained mostly open. Uh, you, you, you know, obviously you go into the grocery store, you have to mask up and, uh, you know, I just feel ridiculous with the whole thing, but I'll do my part, you know, if that's what it takes. And, uh, but uh, when I read about what it's like in other places, I guess I'm pretty happy to be here. So, uh, what else can I say? There's not much going on. I've got auctions coming up at the end of the month. So I'll be running out of town. Still hard to buy cars. <clears throat> I took a picture yesterday of the CarMax, uh, which is next door to Auto House. And frankly, it's as abandoned as I've ever seen it. Uh, in, the, in 15 years, or however long it's been there, 12, 13, it's just never looked like that. And it's insane. It's indicative of what's going on right now. Uh, the supply of new cars is dwindling. Used cars have become kind of you know, in demand, and uh, it's much tougher to get a hold of them. So uh, I don't foresee that getting any better in the near future. And, uh, you know, you get what you get. Um, the goats, they were out this morning, you know, I got some video of them, they were standing on the Boxster, which is, I know that's going to cause scandal uh, beyond words, so we'll see where that goes, but my high hopes is that we're going to have roast leg of goat uh, in the very near future as a, uh, you know, an auto house team dinner or something. Uh, we're all going to, uh, you know, have a big feast based on that, and uh, that's something that's going to make me very, very happy when it happens, so uh, bird activity, quiet cat activity also quiet haven't seen any of them uh, I hear a little bit of chirping but you're always going to so uh, but uh, none have swooped down into my face or anything so that's a plus and no big ones lingering overhead uh, so we're free and clear to get right into this car <clears throat> which is a Jeep uh, Cherokee uh, this is the XJ platform which is yeah, truly the most famous of the bunch, and uh, certainly by a long shot the most influential. Uh, the Cherokee came out in what '74. Uh, it ran through five generations, uh, all the way through current, actually. The current one is the fifth generation, uh, now again named the uh, Cherokee. Uh, the first one was a big sucker, it was the SJ. And it continued on even after it ended uh, in 83 as the, um, uh, you know, basically the same thing as the Grand Wagoneer that's very famous now and collectible. Uh, so Jeep did keep a, a big SUV going. 
But the second generation, the XJ, was mind-blowing when it came out and uh, was a very big deal. Uh, briefly, it was replaced by the KJ and uh, the KK, but they were both sold as the Liberty uh, because they didn't want product confusion with the Grand Cherokee, which was, of course, pretty popular for Jeep. And uh, then finally, this current generation we have now, the KL, uh, it's gone back to being the Jeep Cherokee. Uh, but uh, I don't think for long, frankly. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how long they're going to be able to keep the name. It's not unlike the uh, Washington football team. And, uh, you know, frankly, I really... Okay, I volunteer myself. I want to be named for an attack helicopter, you know, the Bill. I think that would be an awesome attack helicopter. And if I can't have one named after me, then I think there should be one named after, um, oh God, what's his name? Uh, Bernie Sanders. I mean, this thing could fly low. It could come in uh, from the left and it could yell and shout at, you know, its enemies and, and then... Uh, bore them into a sense of complacency, security, uh, before it taxed them to death to build windmills off Hyannisport or something. I, I just think it could be a fantastic name for an attack helicopter because obviously uh, we're not going to be able to use Native American names anymore, although I do think it's highly complimentary. I mean, uh, when you've got one of these Apache helicopters coming over the ridge, everybody's scared shitless. And uh, I think that uh, is a... Uh, yeah, it's a tip of the hat, in my opinion, but yeah, what do I know? Um, anyway, back to this one. So this is the XJ. This one came out in 1984. Uh, it was not the first of its type. It was a response of sorts to the, uh, the now downsized uh, S10 Blazer from Chevrolet and the Bronco 2 from Ford, uh, which were yeah, called the miniature truckettes, if you will, uh, in a very untested market segment called the small SUV. <laughs> I know it seems amazing now to think of it that way, uh, but of course it was true. When those things came out, there really wasn't... Nobody really knew what this segment was going to do. People had a feeling about it, obviously, but it was an unknown at the time. And the Cherokee came out after them, uh, more or less, but it was better than them. And we're going to get into why. And uh, it eventually outsold them, and it became... Uh, probably the seminal 1980s SUV that really brought about the change that uh, that we'll also get into because I'm not entirely happy with the change but I can't necessarily hold it against this particular car uh, anyway this was the first new Jeep in 20 years uh, it hadn't been done in a while. It was the first one. It was the first one that was not body on frame, and that's also a big deal. Uh, this was essentially a unibody. Uh, Jeep, and uh, this is going to make a lot of people nuts, we can basically thank the French for this thing. Uh, AMC had a big partnership, and of course AMC owned it. This is interesting. This particular Jeep, the XJ, was made by three different car companies. The uh, uh, first of all, AMC, and then Chrysler, and then finally Daimler Chrysler. So not only did it run from 84 through 01 in the United States, but 2014 globally, including China, uh, 30 years this thing was made, basically. Uh, but it was made by three different car companies along the way, which is a little bit fascinating. I guess that's not dissimilar to that SJ, the previous Cherokee, and uh, the, the Wagoneer, which had been made since the dawn of time. I mean, basically, Moses was driving one of those things around and uh, they went all the way through 91 or so so that was a long time as well uh, but you can thank the French um, what the hell was his name a guy named Francois Castine uh, I'm probably saying it wrong but it doesn't really matter because he's a French guy uh, he came from Renault he was sent by them uh, to AMC to help develop this vehicle he was a pretty hip guy had started out in motorsports for Renault uh, back in the 60s, and uh, essentially he revolutionized the way that cars went through development. Uh, pretty fascinating stuff, and, and, and you know, AMC went from being the sort of redheaded stepchild of the car world to other car companies, namely the big three, being pretty fascinated by how they were developing their vehicles. And for that, you can thank uh, Francois Castine. He had a lot to do with that. Uh, so anyway, it's body on frame construction. Uh, there I go again. You know, I'm telling you, again, with the whiskey and whatever else, it just screws up the bulleted points in my head. Uh, with the unibody construction, and there goes Peter and his uh, 
rather attractive turbo, I have to say. <laughs> it's a lot better choice than the Samara from a few weeks ago. And I think you could use another taillight. Anyway, uh, unibody construction, which was unusual for Jeep, but underneath they did severe underpinnings from the CJ, the solid axles, and uh, we're going to get onto all that in a minute. But that is a big part of what differentiated it from the uh, miniature uh, Blazer and the Bronco 2. Oh boy. So anyway, 84, this thing comes out. It's an unproven market. It's untested. Uh, here's where Jeep really nailed it. Not only in the design of this thing or the underpinnings, but where they really nailed it was by offering a four-door, which the Bronco 2 and the S10 did not have at that point. Uh, nobody really thought the four-door was going to be the thing. Uh, you know, the two-door is kind of where it was going to be at. Well, that didn't prove true at all. The four-door became much more popular, sold a lot better than the two-door, and uh, it paved the way for this Cherokee to be, uh, frankly, a pretty big deal. Um, it was the first SUV to significantly eat into car sales, and believe me, a lot of companies noticed that. Uh, you know, people who would never have bought a truck before uh, were all of a sudden driving these things around, uh, which was... <laughs> You know, you think of it now, and everybody drives an SUV, but back then, nobody really did. The family wagon was still going. Uh, in fact, that's how AMC marketed this thing, was as a sport wagon, all one word. And uh, it was designed to sort of compete with the idea of the family truckster, you know? Instead of having this big family wagon, you would have this utility vehicle instead, which would, could accomplish basically the same stuff in terms of cargo and uh, capacity, but would also add the utility of four-wheel drive and, uh, you know, towing and things that could make it a much more versatile vehicle. So uh, it hit home and it hit home in a hurry and people just started buying it like crazy. And uh, I think with pretty good reason. So uh, anyway, let's just get into this thing. We're going to start inside the back. Yeah, there's really a lot to get into with this truck, but I'm going to try and keep this video more brief. I really rambled on in the last one uh, to the point of, oh God, there's the phone. Let me see what this is. We'll get right back into it. There it is. It's out. When the goats leave, the cat comes in. Hopefully it stays by that old pickup truck. Anyway. Okay, so here's the thing. The car was wildly successful. In fact, it was so successful that over its years of production, they made 2.8 million of these things. So there's quite a few of them still around. Uh, they were also sold globally in uh, left-hand drive and right-hand drive models. Uh, they were made as police cars, as fire trucks. Well, not, not fire trucks with pumpers, but, you know, for commercial or government use. Uh, they were made for rural mail carriers. In fact, a lot of the ones that went uh, to Japan came back here to the United States after they got a foul of some sort of Japanese law and have become mail carriers in the United States. So uh, you saw quite a few of these things. And back in the 80s, they were incredibly prolific because, again, all of a sudden, people who bought cars wanted to wrap themselves up in uh, what this thing was. And, you know, you could argue that it was all hollow and symbolic and stupid because a lot of SUV stuff, frankly, is. Uh, but this truck really delivered, and I think that's part of what... Uh what makes it so beloved today. But anyway, you can see in the back, okay, so this is it. It had a little temporary spare mounted here uh, on the side, which, uh, you know, is pretty good for room. Uh, they used leaf springs instead of curl springs in the back to keep the uh, luggage space and uh, cargo space real. So uh, you can see there's a ton of room in the back of this thing. Uh, there's no deterrent for toddlers. So if you put one in the back here, they're probably gonna crawl over the seats and come up and get you. Uh, kind of a shame. I like it uh, with the Mercedes-style net that keeps them in the back. But what are you going to do? You can't have it all. So anyway, nice big... And here's the other thing. This thing was like 30 inches shorter and 1,200 pounds lighter than the SJ model that it replaced. But it still kept 90% of the interior room. Uh, a big part of that being the unibody construction of the way that they designed the suspension. So uh, it was extremely versatile and people noticed and that helped things out. And uh, anyway, in the back, you can see plenty of room. Uh, also, that rear seat not just folds down. 
down, but it can also be removed entirely if you need tons of cargo, uh, which carries on to make this thing as versatile as can be, and another part of the reason it's beloved. Uh, this model in 93 still had the fiberglass uh, back hatch, but uh, that later on got replaced by metal. I don't know if that's because of... Uh, uh, cost or what. Uh, you can see I left the original dealer sticker on here, Galliana Chrysler Plymouth Jeep Eagle, if you remember them, uh, out of Fort Myers, because it's nice to see an all Florida vehicle. Uh, this one owner thing, I gotta say that, I gotta interject real quick. This is the greatest success story I've seen from Dalton, who has historically driven the biggest pieces of shit known to man. I mean, honestly, Dalton's cars have been horrific at best, laughable, terrible. And then one day he shows up in this thing. I'm not kidding. This was a Dalton purchase. Uh, I don't know where he got it from. He's got the, look at this, right there, right in front of us. This cat is fearless and now it's gonna hang out under this thing. <sighs> Go on, shoo, shoo. Oh, thank God, it's skittish. Um, but anyway, he shows up in this thing. I'm like, what the hell is this? He said, yeah, I traded the S10. Uh, you know, for this thing. And I'm looking it over, and I, you know, it's a one-owner Jeep. Uh, he's got, like, the window sticker and service records. It's all Florida. And I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. I mean, I don't know if this is a broken clock is right twice a day thing, or, uh, you know, if he just had some weird spell of, of something that worked for him. But uh, the minute I saw it, I thought, okay, well, we got to have this thing. This is, he's going to destroy it. He's going to ruin it. It'll have, like, flat black spray paint in no time and, uh, you know, be running around on a temporary spare. So uh, we had an old Volkswagen Passat hanging around in the back. Maybe it was a rabbit. It doesn't matter. Whatever the hell it was. And uh, I traded him for it because I wanted to save and rescue this Jeep. Uh, and uh, anyway, we'll get more into that as we go. Uh, but, um, all right, you see, I'm losing my place again. <laughs> I really am. All right, real quick, I, I'm just going to get into this for a moment because it's a little bit fascinating. We talked about Francois Castaigne and how he revolutionized the way these AMC vehicles uh, were developed. And frankly, this one, this Jeep made under AMC uh, was pretty revolutionary, not just for being what it was, this sort of revolutionary SUV, but also for being the first non-weird AMC in many years. I mean, you have to remember that uh, this was a company that had come out with the Gremlin, uh, they'd come out with the Pacer, uh, the Matador, uh, then there was the Concord. Uh, you know, these are all very, very frankly strange cars, and uh, they tried to fill a niche that the big three didn't, and they did okay in many, many ways, but but uh, not always, and uh, they were certainly always weird where this one was not. They did have the Eagle series of four-wheel drives that you know were built on the Concord platform, and I thought they were very, very cool, and they were definitely unlike anything out at the time. They were, you know, in a four-wheel drive sedans and wagons, basically, that, uh, you know, some niche buyers liked, and maybe they hearkened to what was to come in a similar way that this did, uh, but they were still, frankly, kind of weird in their own way, and uh, you can't give them the same credit that you would give to uh, this uh, Cherokee XJ. So anyway, Castaigne is doing his thing. He's getting this Jeep together. He's, you know, coming up with a really terrific product. Uh, later on, a guy named Georges Bess, uh, the head of Renault in, uh, in France, is gunned down by some separatist group in 86 or 85, yeah, I think 86, uh, Action Direct or something, but they've replayed it. It's not direct with a ECT, it's direct with a CTE. Uh, anyway, they gun him down in front of his house and his daughter, horrible story. Uh, new Renault management comes on and they decide to hell with it. We're going to get rid of the American stuff because the Alliance which had been very successful for Renault, uh, by the way, in the early 1980s. If you remember the Renault Alliance, that was kind of an interesting car. Uh, but it was losing popularity. It was, you know, getting old in the tooth. They didn't want to replace it with anything else. And away it went. Uh, Renault also had the Fuego, if you remember that thing. And uh, a good friend, actually not really, just a guy I knew, a Norwegian kid, uh, went to a different high school with another friend of mine. Uh, he wedged his Fuego between two trees at one point. But, um, yeah, that's neither here nor there. 
So anyway, because this guy was assassinated, because Renault now decides it wants out of AMC, which it owns, uh, it decides to bail out of America, bail out of its new factories that it was building in Ontario, and it sold the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel to Lee Iacocca and Chrysler uh, for the bargain price of $1.5 billion. I mean, again, Lee Iacocca just comes up with brilliant little things that help his company, help Chrysler a lot. So they bought the number one SUV line in the United States, basically this Cherokee, and they bought uh, Francois Castine, who had revolutionized the production at... Um, uh, at AMC and now would do the very same to Chrysler and that led to everyone adopting his technique. So it was all a very big deal and Jeep people can very soundly thank the French for the way this all went. I know that's devastating but it is what it is. So there is the weird little tidbit. But back then you've got this thing now outselling the Bronco 2 and the um, uh, and the S10 Blazer. Uh, you've got uh, women starting to buy them. Uh, the two-wheel drive versions come out so that people who aren't interested in four-wheel drive can, you know, have them as well. And yeah, it's kind of meaningless as a two-wheel drive, but it sold. And uh, the popularity just started going and going and going. It was going to be replaced in 93, but then, you know, why get there? Look at that bird coming in. Look at those things right there. But why replace something that's selling well? So they um, they didn't. They kept it going and they sold the new product alongside the old one. Uh, let's get under the hood of this thing. So here's where I know I'm going to get flack because, you know, we're talking about one of the greatest four-wheel drives uh, made, certainly in this modern era. Oh, God, and here I come up with a two-wheel drive version. Uh, we're also talking about a vehicle that has one of the greatest six-cylinder engines of all time. <laughs> And I've got the four-cylinder. Oh my God, that's heavy. But I would also like to point out, oh, this is gonna be impossible. Oh, for the love of God, why do they put that prop rod so far back? Oh my God. Uh, so anyway, yeah, here it is, the four-cylinder two-wheel drive version, which uh, again, you know what? I, and let me just say this, you get what you get, okay? I, I buy these cars, I find them, I get the ones that are available to me. And this one, you know, this pretty remarkable survivor showed up like this. So I'm taking the opportunity to talk about the genre as a whole, not about this particular example. So keep your flack to yourself, for God's sake. I already know it. I already know it. Anyway, when it came out in 84, there were two engines. There was this one, the 2.5 liter AMC four-cylinder, uh, which was loosely based on the architecture of the existing inline six that AMC had. And uh, also then the Chevy uh, 2.8 liter V6 because they couldn't quite uh, fit an inline in this thing. Being unibody, it wasn't really meant for a big long engine. Uh, I read a car and driver article about this car when it came out and they were testing them and they were prepared for the four cylinder to be absolute crap uh, like it was in the Bronco 2 and the S10. They called them something like gasoline powered noise machines that basically went nowhere and they were pleasantly surprised by this uh, 2.54. Uh, with the manual gearbox they found it to be peppy, revy, a nice flat torque curve and uh, motivated the truck very very nicely uh, much better than they would have thought and uh, a big part of that was that it was designed as a truck engine not as a car engine uh, in fact the uh, four liter the ultra famous four liter that this engine lives in the shadow of uh, is pretty much the same architecture of this they just added two more cylinders to it so uh, if that wasn't like I mean it's like I, I don't know. It's like you have two football players and uh, two quarterbacks in the same family. And, you know, one uh, went on to have a pretty good college career and the other one is John Elway. You know, I mean, how do you compete with that? I mean, so this motor, as good as it was, had to live in the shadow of this rather incredible older brother. Uh, you can see they were a younger brother, actually. They notched the firewall out uh, to be able to fit the uh, six-cylinder in there, that inline six. That's uh, and, and man, that was a big deal. When it came out in 87, uh, that four-liter engine had, I think then, about 170 or so horsepower and uh, was a revenue. I mean, that was, again, 
170 doesn't sound like much today, but a Mustang GT at the time had like 220. Uh, so it was a very peppy, peppy uh, six cylinder, just as this uh, is a pretty peppy four cylinder. Here it is in its final incarnation uh, from 91 to 96 uh, with Chrysler fuel injection and putting out 130 horsepower. So uh, it does motivate the truck down the road pretty good. Uh, and uh, back in the day, in the early ones, you could get a four speed manual that went away, a five speed manual, which you could get with the six or the uh, uh, or the four, uh, the four speed was only the four, and uh, a three speed automatic, which um, you did not want to get with the four cylinder because it turned it into absolute crap. So, uh, in fact, a few of the car and driver staff said they preferred the four uh, to the Chevy 2.8, uh, and I believe that the Chevy 2.8, that 90 degree V6, is a pretty good engine, uh, but um, yeah, you know, it's noisy, it's not quite. Uh, powerful and uh, you know just didn't really have what uh, the four liter that came out later did that's what really sealed this thing as uh, one of the epic uh, four-wheel drives of all time so anyway everything nice under the hood here proper you know Florida car Let's see if I can get this down without killing myself Boy, that's a heavy hood. And another thing, okay, so now there's the engines covered. We'll get into the suspension real quick because that was fascinating uh, as well. So you've got this unibody construction, uh, you know, with frame, yeah, sort of frame-like members uh, welded to it that house the front and the rear suspension assemblies. Uh, they used solid axles from the CJ, front and rear, uh, which made this thing an off-roading monster. You can see the angle of attack is terrific. The bump does not overhang that much over the front so it has pretty good ground clearance because it's not independent in the front it's a lot less complicated uh, you know there's not a lot of maintenance going on also the ground clearance is consistent it's not going to change from one moment to the next based on the travel of the suspension uh, on this two-wheel drive version instead of reinventing the wheel and putting you know coil springs or something on they just used a solid front axle without a differential so it's more or less the same suspension as the four there's another cat <sighs> coming to team up with the other one and leap up and attach to my face. But anyway, uh, so even the two-wheel drive version has some sort of off-road credibility in the sense that it's got the same solid front axle uh, that performs well. It's got four links in the back. It's got a stabilizing bar up front and uh, then uh, some low-pressure gas shocks. Uh, in the rear, again, they used leaf springs, uh, semi-elliptical, uh, so that uh, coil springs wouldn't incur into the interior space. And, uh, of course, a solid rear axle as well. And and this light unibody frame with all this rugged heavy-duty suspension makes this an off-roading monster and uh, a lot of people still uh, swear by it as one of the great four-wheelers of all time you're gonna see weird little nitwits driving them around with mud all over them because it's just thought of that way and a lot of them got beat to death out in the swamps and dirt roads and mountains so um, you know it just is thought of as one of the great off-road uh, vehicles and that is an other thing of what differentiated it from the Chevy and the Bronco 2 uh, which were body on frame with independent front suspension and just didn't do as well off-road. Uh, this thing had a much better off-road system and four-wheel drive system than most of its buyers deserved. Uh, you could get two different four-wheel drives in it at the time. There was the command track and the select track. Uh, the command track, and I may have those reversed if I do sue me, but uh, the command track was more of a traditional thing with low range that you used in real off-road circumstances, and the uh, select track was almost like a modern all-wheel drive system uh, where uh, it had sort of a viscous coupling up front that would be able to run at highway speeds uh, in four-wheel drive and, you know, slick conditions at 80 miles an hour, and uh, that was, uh, yeah, pretty useful stuff, but I suppose the uh, off-road guys really wanted uh, wanted the uh, the lower version for the you know the true off-roading. Uh, I like the wheels on this thing. And obviously, this one's a pretty much a stripper model, not with pole dancing, but uh, you know low on options, pretty base. Uh, and it probably came with steel wheels and uh, maybe even white wall tires or something. And uh, this one hey, back in the day, this was one owner up until when Dalton bought it a couple months ago. This guy had owned it since new, which was pretty impressive. And uh, he probably put these on in the 80s and. Uh, 
uh, I think he increased the tire size a little bit. Uh, and uh, when it came in, the tire, you know, it didn't get driven much. The tires were old, so we threw on a nice set of Goodyear Wranglers on there to give it a pretty aggressive appearance. But eh, anyway, it is what it is. Uh, the design is absolutely timeless. I mean, this is where this thing really, I mean, it, this is why I love this car. It has everything. It's got the whole package. Uh, the design, it's inherent of the early Range Rovers. Uh, it's no more than you need. It's no less than you need. It's got subtle hints at the Jeep styling. You can see the vertical grille in the front, uh, the squared off wheel wells. Uh, then you get into this greenhouse that's all business, all angular, big long rear window, very rectangular, very rectangular front and sides. It is clean, lovely, immaculate design. Uh, that while it definitely looks old and classic today, it still looks fresh. And there's a lot of people who just see this as the best SUV design of all time. And uh, frankly, I tend to agree with them. I think uh, they really hit it out of the park with this thing. They nailed it. Uh, it just has a look uh, that I think uh, really fits the uh, times today and fit, definitely fit the times back in the 80s when it was made. Came in a lot of different incarnations, not just two-door, four-door. There was also a pickup truck called the Comanche another warrior Indian tribe. This is not going to last, I guarantee. Uh, but uh, the Comanche was um, uh, a pretty neat pickup that uh, eh, did what it was supposed to do and was based on the same platform. Uh, you could get a bunch of different trim levels. There was the Laredo, there was the Wagoneer, uh, there was the, um, uh, the Limited, there was the Country, uh, all kinds of different stuff with, you know, varying degrees of of fancy bits like leather, power windows, and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, you could get it in a variety of different ways, different engines, different transmissions, all of which added to its versatility. Uh, I think the two-door, again, is the best-looking version. I really like that long back window. Uh, I think these are the ones that are going to be the most collectible. Uh, I think the 97 to 01s are pulling the most money with the Bring a Trailer set right now. They're the ones people want with the 4-liter and the mild updates, even though it was basically the same uh, as uh, earlier versions in terms of styling. They did add some updates here and there. Uh, but every one of these now, every clean old Survivor, uh, is uh, collectible at a minimum, even of an entry-level collectible, and the prices are all trending upward. Uh, even, you know, again, there's a bunch of them out there, so parts are easy, mechanical parts are easy to come by, body parts, all that stuff. You can get whatever you need for them. And uh, they do make a terrific uh, sort of fun entry-level collectible vehicle that you can drive around and have fun with. And you do get a lot of thumbs up from people. Uh, these do more or less qualify for the Jeep wave. Uh, which uh, I guess if that's your thing, you're going to get it. You know, this one has a trailer hitch. All right, so let me get my crap in the back. Uh, I'm going to pull up again out of the sun, and uh, then we'll get into the inside and keep going. All right, bags in, tags hanging from the back. We're good to go. You know, as I look at that tag, it makes me think of um, all the Craigslist. And I, obviously, I'm looking for cars like crazy, so I'm going through all these Facebook Craigslist ads, eBay, you know, anywhere I can find a car. And there's a variety of people who either use some sort of paint program or their thumbs to block out their license plates. And I'm thinking, man, okay, first of all, why? I mean, this is a public thing that's being driven around with anyway. I mean, the license plate's on the back of the car. People are going to see it. Uh, you stick it out in the internet. I mean, have you ever tried to find somebody's name from their license plate? I mean, basically, you would have to be Kojak or, or some sort of international terrorist organization. I mean, there is just simply no way. I mean, you ask the DMV what time it is, and they tell you no uh, and before they realize you don't want something other than that, and then they hesitantly tell you what time it is is, but uh, they're not going to give you the name. You go to the DMV with a, a tag number, they're not going to give you a name and address. They're just not. So, I don't know. I don't know what makes people so paranoid about that, but um, yeah, anyway, let's just get into this thing. Love the big roof rack on this. That was probably optional. Uh, all these weird little things were. Uh, so, look at the weird seats in this thing. They were actually 
from Renault. They were more or less the same ones from that little alliance with a little bit of tweaking to make them fit this thing. Uh, they've got a sort of a weird platform going up into the sort of very small looking cushion on the bottom. If you're a big fat guy, your rump may push through that, but uh, nah, apparently not. Maybe they use pretty tough foam. Uh, but uh, they, they were a bit of a sea change when they came out in terms of seats, and they were better than the ones theoretically uh, in the um, uh, the S10 and the Bronco 2, even if uh, they weren't, uh, eh, they were a bit strange with the upholstery and cloth and stuff that they use, but that's AMC for you. Uh, you know, the fit and finish, I mean, this thing is cheap, man. I mean, there's no doubt about that. You see, it's got window cranks, these things that confuse snowflakes, uh, uh, those in rotary phones and dial-up internet, you know, all the stuff that they really don't want to think about unless they're hipsters. Uh, cheap little armrest, you know, all this gear. But uh, this one being sort of a base package, if you will, uh, also makes it much easier to live with, more dependable, and that's why I've always kind of liked stripper models to an extent. Uh, I do love having options, there's no doubt, and I'd probably prefer power windows in this thing, uh, but there is a simplicity and utility to having the base package that I like. Uh, okay, the seats all fold forward. Uh, because this thing had a long wheelbase, they were able to put the back seats in front of the rear axle. You can see there's the rear axle back there. Uh, the back seats sit in front of it. Uh, that, again, was not the case with the Bronco 2 or the S10. Uh, and what that did was lead to easier entry and egress from the back, so your Canadians are going to be pretty spry and chipper getting in and out of there. Uh, because they didn't use coral springs, the seat's nice and wide, so you can fit three of them back there without a problem. And uh, then again, the seats do fold down and remove completely for added utility. So, uh, a very good design and you have to hand it to the, <laughs> the French. Oh my God, the poor Jeep guys. You have to hand it to old Francois. And, uh, you know, what he went on to do a bunch of other, I think he was a big part of what the, making the Viper for Chrysler back in the 90s. He was a pretty cool cat, I gotta say. Uh, but anyway, the uh, rear seats are very usable in this thing. And another big part of what made them such a success, and of course all of that is improved upon uh, for people who want space with the four-door version. Hop in. Okay, uh, you know, you could get a variety of different uh, gauge clusters in this thing. This one's about as base as it gets. You got an 85 mile an hour speedo uh, and a uh uh, a fuel gauge and then just, you know, three idiot lights and one dead one unless that does, oh yeah, that's the upshift light there, so uh, so four idiot lights of sorts and then some more on the side here uh, if you need them. Uh, this thing probably came with an AM AM radio, so the guy upgraded to some uh, Clarion CD from the 90s. Uh, he did add air conditioning, thank God, so it's got nice cold air conditioning. Uh, also, uh, wipe wash on the rear wiper, you've got a cigarette lighter. Uh, the manual gearbox is a really, really nice option in these things. Very, very desirable with the four liter and too rare and they bring a premium. Uh, it's it's an absolute necessity with the four cylinder. Uh, you made an automatic to this four cylinder and it's just crappy to drive. Uh, this five speed manual makes it very nice and peppy. Believe it or not, even that center console was uh, optional. Uh, if it had the four wheel drive system, it would be with a lever right here and uh, that would be nice to show you now, but again, this is the one that I got. A uh, weird little place to put drugs or switchblades or, you know, whatever it is you can fit in there. Probably had something else on other models. And then a weird fold forward kind of uh, glove box where, uh, again, you can fit some crap in there. Uh, pretty short little dash in this thing. Uh, you also get a center console. A uh, nice little spot for gun storage. So you'd be able to fit a handgun or a revolver in there. Also a pretty good basic three-spoke steering wheel, which I like, but a very annoying warning buzzer. Uh, you do have twin mirrors with uh, manual adjustments, so back to that thing where you set up your right mirror and you have to reach over so you lose where you're going to be sitting to adjust it. You adjust it, come back, decide it's not right, go back, adjust it again. It's a long and irritating process. Uh, anyway, let's go for a spin. So there's that, I'm going to call it a big four. Don't laugh at me. I'm going to call it that firing to life. And again, I mean, it was a truck design, that four cylinder. You know, it was made for 
uh, this purpose. It was not, uh, you know, adapted from a car model. Uh, while other engines at the time had standard testing of about 250 hours, Renault tested this one and the 2A Chevy, by the way, at 1,000 hours and uh, wanted to be sure they were pretty reliable. Who knew Renault had it in them? Right, let's go for a spin. And this is going to be good, because you don't have to take my word for it that the 4 in here is pretty good. I mean, remember, it's basically the same architecture as that famous 4 liter. If that motor wasn't so globally appreciated and famous, this thing would be considered a lot better than... People would know about it anyway, the 4. And they wouldn't be just, oh god, it has the 4, you know? Uh, if the uh, 6 cylinder was crappy, everyone would love the 4 cylinders. The same way the Toyota trucks have a big following for their 4 cylinder models, even when the 6s are out there. Uh, Dalton, we have crappy windows today. Even on a car he owned. Eh, you know, it's not that bad. I guess we've got some clouds. say it's the most refined four-cylinder out there you definitely hear it uh, but it does have a surprising amount of torque and a surprising amount of pep uh, and the steering frankly is better in these uh, uh, cars with the four-cylinder because it takes like 50 or 60 pounds off the front suspension uh, I suppose you could also argue the two-wheel drive versions have more responsive steering because there's now not the weight of the four-wheel drive stuff up there as well uh, so it becomes a little bit more responsive Weight's a killer. Eh, it goes down the road nice. I'm not going to get, you know, too crazy driving down this uh, residential street. We had that woman with the strange hat who always carries the bag of shit and her dog with her, so she could pop out at any time. Anyway, so here's the thing. I should hate this thing. I should really absolutely despise this car. I mean, this truck, this SUV, what I guess we can really call it an SUV. It is in the truest sense of the phrase. This car is the reason that the Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser is dead and the Nissan Rogue is alive. Uh, I mean, it's it, it led to every stupid little car-derived front-wheel drive mini SUV that you see today. Everything is a mini SUV. Everything. Uh, the only rare exceptions are mid-size and full-size. And look at them. Everywhere you look, there's just SUVs. And you can pin a lot of that on the popularity of this car. It probably also led to acceptance of extreme sports. Another thing I find ridiculous, it, it led to yuppies wearing $400 hiking boots and designer, you don't see many Studebakers running around, designer lumberjack shirts into an air-conditioned Starbucks. I mean, uh, even though this thing was incredibly unpretentious and purpose-built, uh, many of the people who bought it weren't. They were extremely pretentious. So. I mean, this thing is to blame for so much of what I detest about the car world today. Uh, and I should hate it. I should absolutely hate it. Every time I see some stupid little SUV driving around, if it wasn't for the way old people like minivans, it's probably the only thing we'd see on the road. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I see the electric SUV Mustang coming out, well, you can blame this. Uh, you know, this car, more than any other, this is what trained Americans away from sedans. It, it killed the family sedan. It killed the family wagon. It killed the personal luxury car. The coupes were out the window. Everybody wanted an SUV. Every 30-plus-year-old woman is miserable in life if she's not driving some vehicle that makes her look like a wildlife photographer or a general contractor. I mean, this thing is the bane of Greenpeace. Not that that's terrible in my book, but I mean, it, it just led to so much about the car world currently that I hate. So I should really, really hate this thing, but I don't because it was real. It was, you know, it did exactly what it said it was going to do. It did it with style, class, and durability. It was simple, easy to live with capable at everything it wanted to be capable at. It got pretty good mileage, uh, incredible off-road manners, incredible on-road manners, again, thanks to Mr. Castain and, you know, his uh, the, the revolutionary processes that, despite having solid axles, actually made this thing perform really, really well on the road. 
and uh, it just led to everything bad. It, it really did, but it was good, and uh, of course that's why they sold so many. That's why they're still popular today. Uh, that's why I frankly like them, uh, even if uh, even if I really shouldn't. Um, you know, uh, when the four liter came out and it was the greatest engine of all time, it just, okay, but first of all, the four liter cemented this thing as a terrific car. Uh, in 91, the Ford Explorer came out and that was it. That was the end of it. That was the vehicle that got everybody fleeing from wagons and sedans and coupes into SUVs. And uh, there would have been no Explorer if it wasn't for uh, the incredible success of this Cherokee. So it does have a lot to blame. I mean, but here's another thing. I mean, in a world today, in this state of affairs today, where you can't believe half the shit you read here and see on the news or TV, uh, you know, this thing is the real deal. It's honest. You can count on it. It's dependable, like a golden retriever. I mean, it's just... It's something that you can believe in and uh, you know that is not only why it's going to be beloved in uh, car history uh, But why it's um, you know why it was so successful and why people still have an interest in them today and uh, Why you're still going to see them running around for many years to come so There it is I hate this one-handed shifting see that four gets up and goes you know for what it is and I mean this is again 93 this one's the 130 horse version uh, it's pretty peppy and it's pretty fun to drive I've really enjoyed uh, putting a few miles on this thing uh, it is for sale at Auto House of Naples if you have an interest 239-263-8500 uh, on the web at autohousenaples.com uh, thank you so much for having a look. I appreciate it. Going to try to get some more, at least one more up this week. I've got a green Bonneville I'm working on. I've been trying to get that car in for a long time. We'll see if I can't get it ready. Uh, I had to order a part for the 85 old, so that got delayed. And uh, there's a few other cars in the pipeline, but, eh, you know, they're hard to get ready. So uh, thanks for having a look, and we will see you with the next one. Take care.